I'm Jim Giambalvo, Dean of the Michael G. Foster School of Business, and it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to our speaker series, Leaders to Legends. I'm very proud to have as our speaker this morning one of the most highly regarded business leaders in the U.S., who also happens to be a UW alum, Phyllis Campbell. Phyllis is the chairman of uh, the Pacific Northwest for J.P. Morgan, and prior to that, she served as CEO of the Seattle Foundation, which is the largest community foundation in Washington. She also has a deep knowledge of banking, having also served as a CEO of U.S. Bank of Washington. In terms of board memberships, she's the lead independent director at Alaska Airlines, and she's also on the board of Nordstrom. She's received numerous awards, but since this is the week that we honored uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, I thought I would mention one. She received the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Vision from the Mountaintop Award. Please join me in a warm welcome for a great business and social leader, Phyllis Campbell. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. Thank you so much. I turned it on. I'm good. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, for, uh, Jim, for that just too kind introduction. I, I always smile at the word um, legend because I actually um, was invited to do this uh, breakfast, uh, Leaders to Legends, probably 15 years ago, but it was the uh, dean well prior to, uh, to, to Jim. But I got the call the week before and said, you know, our, our main speaker, who was Phil Kahn at a Boeing at the time, had an emergency and had to cancel. Would you substitute at the last minute? So here I am. I said, well, was I the second or third choice for this program? <laughs> so I'm not sure I was the first choice for today, but I, I am very happy to be here. And thank you for the kind invitation. So um, a couple things I, I did want to talk about, uh, talk with you this morning is uh, in the title, Culture is a Corporate Asset. What is our role? I wanted to cover just some macro trends that have been going on that all of us are very well aware of. And I'm thrilled that we have a, a mixture of uh, students from different programs, but also uh, friends, colleagues, people from the business community here, because I want to make sure we have a conversation about this, because honestly, I'm not here to say I have a lot of answers. Um, I've just given a lot of thought to this, particularly in the last six months. So um, I, I'll talk about maybe 20 minutes, and then um, Corrine assures me we have lots of uh, Q&A, and I'd love to hear your thoughts and ideas as, as I frame up the subject for you today. So let's first talk about just some of the trends, because, uh, and again, they're, they're not new things, but I would certainly say that the last, uh, let's just say, year to two years, I feel like there's been just an acceleration of, of several major trends, and an acceleration in not just a linear way, but really an exponential way. Of course, all of you live in the world, especially the, the younger folks here in the world of technology, but artificial intelligence, um, it, it's, it's stunning really what's happened. And I just came from CES last week in Las Vegas, which was so interesting. This is my um, second year there. But this year, the, uh, the, uh, really what, how they framed the change, I think, from even last year to this year was that technology is really moving us from digitization or a world of just digitizing everything now to what they're calling datafication. And we can talk about that a lot more, but again, you live in this world, so you understand that really what that means is now we're trying to figure out what do we do with all this data? How do we use it? How do we get smarter? How does artificial intelligence and machine learning help us get smarter, both in business and for as a consumer? So anyway, we could talk about that, but that's really not the subject of today. The second trend that I think is um, we've all read in the news, um, we certainly, for those of us female and that have been in the workforce for a number of years, the whole Me Too, you know, Time's Up movement, and I don't think I've seen a social movement that's come together as quickly to speak out against uh, environments of sexual harassment and sexual violence like I have now, and, and to see just women in the entertainment industry, as we saw, coming together at the, at the Golden Globes, but really coming together in a much larger movement to say, not only is time up, but we're going to establish you know, defense funds. We're going to really step up, speak out. We're, we're united. I mean, lots of things that are going on that I think is more than just a, a, a temporary movement. It feels like this is a very uh, lasting, 
movement of women finally coming together to say, time is up, uh, we need to really work together, but now women are saying, as women consider running for political office, why not me? So this is something interesting that, that does relate a little bit to what I'm going to talk about uh, today. Probably the last two things I would just say is macro trends that kind of set the stage for what I'm talking about uh, here is uh, the um, minority majority shifts in our country. And again, I don't have to tell all of you about that. This university is a great, I think, living uh, laboratory for what's happening in our society. If I just look around this room, the diversity in this very room, I think, speaks volumes. So if we think about it today, one out of five of us are people of color in the country. And I think we all, you know, demographers differ on is a change going to happen when the majority minority population shift. But I think it's fair to say probably in the next 20 years anyway, uh, minority populations will become the majority in our country. So that's, I think, something else to really think about. The last trend, and I'm not going to go there today because we could spend a whole day on that, and that's just the political divide in the country. Again, I, I just, uh, in my um, hundreds of years of, of living, and you know, and I've been around a lot, watching lots of political trends over the years, I, 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 I don't recall a time when I've seen really the uh, tales of the, of the bell curve so, um, you know, so dispersed in so many ways because I feel like <clears throat> there's, there's so many positions that have been locked in really on the extreme sides that are really almost kind of forming the debate in the country. So again, we could talk more about that, but I want to just really quickly do a grass tops view of those trends to really get into the subject that I want to talk with you about today. So before I do that, I just thought I'd give you a, just a quick couple of factoids about my background. Uh, because I, I think people ask me, uh, why are you so um, are passionate, I guess, about the subject of culture and values and really what I would say are value-based workplaces? And so I, I think just a couple of factoids from my background might help give you a little context for those of you that don't know me. I was raised in Spokane, just talking to a couple of you about Spokane, um, obviously a minority family in Spokane. So. The backdrop for my family was that my father was here in Seattle, actually. His father ran a little grocery store up on Capitol Hill, not too far from Seattle University. And he actually was a, a community leader here. He had uh, many friends who became part of the great Northwest artists, uh, Mark Toby, Paul Horiuchi. A lot of the artists used to gather in my grandfather's, for lack of a better term, salon above the grocery store. Well, the World War II broke out. And unbeknownst to my grandfather, the FBI was kind of watching what was going on. And they saw people coming and going from their house. So during the hysteria of the war, when the US obviously was fighting Japan, I think that the FBI assumed somehow my grandfather was conspiring. And so uh, when the internment order came out, which was the internment order that incarcerated Japanese Americans off of the West Coast, uh, my grandfather was taken first, and he was taken to a military camp in North Dakota, incarcerated. Of course, there are the, my father and his six siblings left with no understanding of where he went, what was happening. Well, when the internment order came out, they finally understood that it was going to affect all Japanese Americans, including their family. So long story short, <clears throat> he ended up getting out um, into Spokane. His brother got him into a high school in Spokane, Gonzaga Prep to get his education. The rest of the family who had to stay behind were put in a camp in uh, Idaho, Minidoka, Idaho. So the reason I share this story is that uh, when my father got out, which is how we got to Spokane, he uh, got out of high school and he said, I'm going to enroll in the US Army. And he, uh, along with many other Japanese Americans who wanted to show they were American and loyal, uh, enrolled in the U.S. Army, uh, became part of a decorated unit in the European theater for the U.S. Army. Now, he never got deployed because actually, unfortunately, he broke his arm. He really did want to go. But he came back to Spokane after he got out and couldn't find a job. Nobody was, um, w uh, could employ or was employing, really, Japanese Americans. But a, a, a fellow gave him a break as a dry cleaner, which is a great story. Anyway, became a dry cleaner. Um, eventually owned the business. I got to work in the business. I always say, Jim, that's where I got my love of business. Got to do a little bit of everything. And 
really got uh, engaged. But what I really learned from, I think, his experience, his uh, demeanor, and everything about him was about loyalty, you know, service above self, um, resilience, persistence, um, and, and doing the right thing and, and giving back. I mean, in spite of all of this, you know, he not only enrolled in the Army, served the country, but what he did was he always said, you know, we've been very lucky. We don't have much. You know, we, we grew up pretty poor in Spokane, but part of it was he'd say, you know, in spite of some of the discrimination, in spite of all of this, you know, there are generous people around. The, there are, you know, there are nonprofits here, the, ch the church we belong to. Everybody was very, very generous and kind-hearted. So always give back. Always make sure that whatever you do, you give back more than you take out, whether it's a workplace, whether it's an educational institution. So I really learned a lot from that um, experience growing up and I think observing some of the values that, um, that were there. I guess later on in my career, I'd just say one quick vignette is that I was, I've been very, very fortunate to have a lot of mentors through my life and career, mentors who have <coughs> really um, given me, uh, again, a lot more than I think I've ever given, but one particular mentor that really gave me a break that actually uh, Jim knows from uh, some history that he's had here with the Foster School is a guy named David Clack, who uh, he was the original chairman of my first bank, Old National Bank in Spokane. And he'd always say, in fact, I know, uh, Louise, he's come to the EMBA program uh, years earlier when he used to really impart the philosophy that was something like this. The more you give, the more you get back. It's an unending cycle. And what he would say is it's kind of like this, you know, really closed loop in that, you know, we have an obligation as a business to give back to the community. And it comes back to you. But you don't do it because of what comes back to you. It just does. But the more you give, the more you get back. And you must give, you know, put more into the community similar philosophy than you take out, particularly as a business. So um, he really became um, one of my first business mentors. And in fact, he was responsible for my coming to the EMBA program at the University of Washington because some of you heard me tell this quick story. But he said to me one time, you know, have you ever thought about getting your MBA? And I was living in Spokane at the time. I said, well, no, I really haven't. I mean, I've, I've been fortunate that I have, you know, obviously my undergraduate business degree. I, I'm good. And he said, well, no, Phyllis, I know you went to WSU undergrad. I really want to send you to UW so you can get a real education. <laughs> that's a true story. So, so that's how I ended up here. I said, works for me. Um, but I think, you know, I can go on about mentors, but I think what I really want to say in this part is that, you know, I, I, there's no question that mentors like David, uh, my first uh, mentor at U.S. Bank, were really people of honor. They conveyed by their actions, so it wasn't just what they said, it's what they did, uh, a positive culture. They modeled a, a values-based leadership. They really modeled the kinds of traits that I think really what I would say constitute a very positive corporate culture. And I've been very lucky to be, to be part of that. So let me just turn to the question now of what constitutes a positive corporate culture, because all of you are either uh, working now or you will be working, but you probably many of you work for a number of employers uh, like I have. And I, I think I've, I've certainly been an observer as well as a participant in what constitutes a positive corporate culture. And then I think we'll talk a little bit about some of the hows before I close. <clears throat> you know, it doesn't take too much digging in the news, does it, recently, to find places where things haven't gone well. And, you know, I, I, I sit back as a student of business and really examine things and say, where did this start? How did this start? Was this a one-off uh, incident that this company experienced? Or was it part of a larger pervasive culture? Where were the leaders? Where was the board? So, uh, you know, I ask a lot of those questions and really try to dig a little bit in some of the cases. We can talk about some of them. But, I mean, you can think about any of them recently. I mean, we talked about the Me Too movement and the entertainment in industry and the Weinstein Company. We, you know, we can think about Uber and what they've been going through over the last couple of years. We can think about Volkswagen. Even, you know, in, in our own industry, Wells Fargo. But there's, there's so many that, you know, you, you, you can say some of these things are episodic. But you, I really do sit back and examine what went wrong. And particularly from a board perspective, 
what could the board have done differently? So just think about, hold that thought as we talk a little bit about, about culture. So um, a recent report that just came out, uh, Hydrogen Struggles published a report called Find Your Place on the Culture Continuum. And here's what they said, quote, by starting with a clear-eyed view of where a company's culture is, senior executives can articulate where it could be and then sparked the sorts of frank management discussions and conversations that help link culture to business goals. So I think it's really appropriate to think of it in that context. I don't think culture exists over here, as, although it, it, it should be probably much larger and it's an overarching uh, thing over business goals, but it has to be linked. And so I, I think that was a really key takeaway from what I wanted to point out. And a couple of the factors, I'll just list five that they listed in this report where they said, here's instances where culture is out of sync. Factor one, values and strategy are misaligned. So think about that. Factor two, there is internal competition and poor cross-functional collaboration. So particularly in large organizations like ours, where you're global, you have many, many divisions, cross, uh, cross uh, line of business, cross-functional collaboration is something we think about all the time. Now, factor three, there's a lack of diversity. We'll talk about that in a minute. Factor four, there's a struggle to engage and retain critical talent. I guess that's obvious if you see high turnover. And factor five, performance metrics are internally focused and mainly on the numbers. So, I mean, these are not big ahas to me, but in each of the examples I listed earlier, you can kind of go through these factors and say, oh, okay, that's where that went wrong. That's what wasn't examined. That's what was misaligned. So I just, you know, if you, if you want to grab the article, it's just uh, Hydrogen Struggles on their website. It's called Find Your Place in the Culture Continuum. It's a very interesting article. So those are, I think, a couple things to think about. But on the positive side, you know, I would say that my observation is companies, and I've as Jim said, been fortunate to be part of uh, companies where culture and strategy are aligned. Some of the indicators to me are, you know, certainly uh, high employee engagement, high employee engagement scores, high customer satisfaction scores. I mean, you can look at these kinds of um, indicators, particularly from a board level, and say, if, if I can look at the employee surveys all the way through the organization, there's at least a synchronicity of engagement and answers that lead up to that. Never perfect, but you know, at least they're good indicators. If I can look at the outside customer satisfaction scores and I can look at customer complaints and, and you know, kind of do some correlations there, you can get a real sense from an outside point of view what's going on. Other ones, certainly visible indicators are high, to, you know, again, uh, uh, a good uh, atmosphere of diversity. Again, those metrics are easily uh, looked at diversity and inclusion. Um, certainly, I would say community involvement. How, uh, how good is this organization at really being a community steward, a community partner? And that's something I think that is part and parcel of a great culture. And then um, last but not least, uh, an, an environment of continuous improvement. Is this an organization that's constantly learning and adapting and thinking about these trends that we talked about and, and really thinking, are we keeping up with the trends in Technology? Are we keeping up with the, you know, the things that are going on in the in the social and environmental areas? And and to me, that's really important. It's always questioning your your yourselves as uh, leaders of a company. So I think I just wanted to say um, for my my organization I work for now, a couple things that I wanted to give as an example uh, are that at J.P. Morgan Chase, you know, I we we talk all the time about culture and. One of the things that I value working for J.P. Morgan Chase is we go all the way back to 100 years ago and always cite, and if you ask any of my colleagues, they'll, they'll cite the same thing. What undergirds your culture? And everybody will say, J.P. Morgan back um, 100 years ago. Now, now J.P. Morgan wasn't an angel, so I don't want to put him up here in that category. But he, he understood culture even then. And what he always used to say everywhere he went, is we're about doing first-class business in a first-class way. And everybody knows that at the company, and we all know what that means. Well, what does that mean? It really means that, in all cases, we put our customers and our communities first. 
And if we do things in a first-class way, that is checking ourselves, are we doing the right thing in our customers' interests, in the community interest, then it's the right thing to do, not in our interests. And that's really an important part. And over my now nine years at J.P. Morgan Chase, I've seen people really, you know, leave because they don't live by exactly by these kinds, by the philosophy that undergirds the company. So culture is something that is formed over a lot of years typically. Now for the newer tech companies, it's you know obviously more nascent. But I think culture is something that has to be purposely thought about, managed, and led. And, and really ensuring that people that don't live by the culture are certainly given fair warning, but in the end, if, if they're not with you, then they're not with you, and that, that I think is rooting, you know, having to root out some of that is really important. So um, really what I would say on that is that, um, you know, it's not, having a great corporate culture is not bulletproof. It doesn't mean you don't make mistakes. We've made lots of mistakes, and people say, well, boy, what happened to you with the London Wales example that was out of alignment with your culture? Yes, it was, and it was not systemic, but it was a bad mistake, it was public, it you know, hurt the reputation of our company. But it was rooted out quickly when Jamie Dimon, our boss, knew about it. He stepped up right away and said, look, I made a mistake, I wasn't on top of this. It was a problem, it is a problem. I'm saying publicly, I'm responsible, we're gonna fix it. Uh, but it could be you know, a, a long, expensive fix, and it was. Um, and I won't get into the details of that because that's part of, been part of the public news. But what I would say about culture, uh, for, particularly for Northwest companies, and you've heard through this program a lot of the leaders of our Northwest companies, I really think we've got companies here that get this, by the way. I mean, I think, feel really fortunate that we, and I've been associated with a number of these companies, but every company that you think about, whether it's Costco to Starbucks to, you know, you name it, you think about the culture, and I think we can all, because we're customers and or we um, know a number of people, or some of you may work at some of these companies, you, you can articulate the culture, and you can say that's a strong culture, that's a positive culture. So I really feel like we're lucky to be here in the Pacific Northwest where we have a, a very strong uh, culture. But the one factor I wanted to touch on for a minute is diversity and inclusion. So I really do think that, if I think about when I was here 15 years ago or so, I think I made the statement, you know, we're on a good journey towards really achieving good diversity and inclusion in our companies here in the Pacific Northwest, certainly, but nationally. And I think I was, at that point, very hopeful. The numbers were going up with women on boards, although it was slow. The numbers were going up on women and people of color less so, but still at least in a positive direction of running Fortune, let's say 500 companies. So I was very hopeful as I thought about it. By the time I would, you know, at least that we would roll around to the year 2010, let's just say, that we'd have a, a good critical mass as these trends, you know, began to take a slow upward climb. Well, I, you know, I'm disappointed, I have to tell you. I'm disappointed that we as a even Northwest company group haven't made that much progress. Um, I'm working right now with a group of women uh, on looking at diversifying corporate boards just from a gender perspective right now, not even thinking about people of color, but it's really been an eye-opener. We did a benchmark study on Northwest companies and said what percentage, Jim was part of this uh, discussion group, what percentage of uh, women occupy the seats of Northwest-based publicly traded companies. And we thought it would be so much better than the nation, which is at that time 17%, which is not good, by the way. Well, the sad news is that we were less than the national average here at 16%, not much less, but still less than. And I just, I think we were all so disappointed because in spite of what I said about positive corporate culture, which I do believe, in spite of what I said about DNI being part of it, and everybody, I think, understanding that in their heart and soul, the numbers just didn't prove it out. So that was a number of years ago. Now we're at about 19% here in the Pacific Northwest of just gender uh, diversity on corporate boards. But that's not good enough. That's just not good enough. And I, you know, I often think, uh, I sit on the Alaska Air Group board, as was mentioned, and we have always been stated as you know, one of the most diverse boards in America, but that's by design. 40% of us are female of the independent directors, 40% of us are people of color. And I will tell you this, the discussions are much richer, 
the questions are much tougher. And probably like you experienced for those of you in study groups that have diverse study groups, which I think most of them are by definition, you know, you can agree. Diversity and inclusion, there's a competitive advantage because you question each other, you push, you test, you see things from a different perspective, uh, again, by dint of our background. So I would just say that uh, there's no question that to me that this is a competitive advantage, but I do think that it also undergirds having an environment of true diversity and inclusion both really makes for better performance. Better performance and really in a sense forms kind of that corporate culture piece that we're talking about which is nothing but a positive. So we've got a long ways to go as a country. We've got a long ways to go in the business community. Um, just one other report I saw yesterday uh, took a cut at the top 3,000 companies in the United States that are publicly traded and said, again, by gender, what percentage of women constitute the largest uh, 3,000 companies uh, of board seats, or how, what percentage are women? And it was 16%. So, you know, no matter what, which way you look at the data, people will tell you, oh, there's lots of progress, women are filling lots of seats, and I kind of get back to, yeah, but we're still at somewhere between 16 and 19 percent, and, you know, to me, that's, that's not acceptable, and people of color are less than 5 percent. So, we'll hold that thought as we move into more discussion. So, the last question I want to pose to all of us as business leaders, as, you know, future business leaders, is what's our role? So given all these changes, given all the challenges, given I think what we know about a positive impact of corporate culture to corporate results, you know, what, what's our role? What's our role? And I ask myself that all the time, by the way, so it's not something I'm just posing to all of you. So the way I answer the question for myself is I, I think back on my early journey with my growing up, uh, people that were really gave me a break. I think about Dave Clack's mentorship and, you know, his really the corporate value set and his forming corporate culture by his example. And I really think that's hopefully what I can be part of and to, to aspire to and really think about, you know, how do I really set a tone at the top in my organization that I work for? Yes, but, you know, any organization that I volunteer for, so nonprofit boards I sit on, um, corporate boards I sit on, places I speak, what, what can I do to hopefully create a larger conversation about the importance of this and maybe some of the barriers that are still there? So um, really I think the, the last thing I wanted to leave with you are some takeaways from uh, a report that was just done. And if you want to see a copy of it, it's actually a great report. I sit on the, um, it's the National Association of Corporate Directors, and I was a Blue Ribbon Commissioner this last year on a report called Culture as a Corporate Asset. It's on the NACD website, so NACD.org. And this is, a, uh, I think, a really, uh, in some ways, it, it, there's no big surprises in here, but there's a lot of toolkits in here that if you want to look at them and say, how do I check my corporate culture, or how do I know, or what are some questions I need to ask, or what do I need to think of in risk management? This report, with all of its uh, appendices, talks about how you do that. But I think one of the things that we really focused on were some very practical takeaways, particularly for corporate directors, but this is true really for anybody who's in a leadership role. So I'm going to leave you with these five takeaways out of this report, and I'd love to have your comments and questions. So the five takeaways are this. Number one, get a holistic view of your current corporate culture. It's been really interesting as I've gone out and spoken on this when I ask CEOs, what is your culture? And this is mostly of smaller companies. And they sort of look at you and say, you know, I, it's a little bit of fumbling and you get a few words, but there's, there's a real aha that happens here because if you can't describe your own corporate culture, what it is that undergirds it, you know, there, there's a real problem because probably the rest of your middle management and certainly the employees of the organization probably can't articulate it either. So be able to articulate it, number one, what's your culture. Number two, test, test, test. Test the reliability of the independence of the data you're getting to test. Is your culture really truly, is your, are your practices, I'm sorry, practices in alignment with the culture? And I mentioned some things earlier, employee surveys 
customer complaints. Um, in the Wells Fargo case, there, were, there was litigation that was uh, public that I think should have caused people to say, What's, you know, what is going on here? What, what does this mean? And if it's episodic, I want to know that it's truly episodic, not systemic. So an inquisitive, inquisitive mind are, you know, how do I know that my culture is in alignment? Number three, monitor and follow up quickly on flags. So again, I think that, you know, I, I read all this Me Too stuff and I think, you know, where, where, were, where were the leaders? Where was the board thinking about all these complaints that were surfacing? Um, I'm sure that through the HR hotline there were a number of complaints. I'm sure even through the whistleblower hotline you probably could have read about a lot of these complaints even though they weren't financial. There were, you know, there are interesting ways to find out what is actually going on. Where are these complaints surfacing? How, was it, how are they being handled? Are we settling them and trying to brush them away? Are we truly asking ourselves what is going on? How do we find out more? What, you know, what do we need to know to get to the bottom of these and how do we act quickly? So monitor and follow up on flags. Number four, um, build accountability around metrics and align rewards accordingly. I can't tell you how many of these cases I've looked through the rewards and compensation system, said, oh, okay, so they were rewarding on numbers only, widgets, sales, um, you know, uh, market share, and nothing about customers, nothing about employee engagement, nothing about um, community or stakeholder engagement. So it, you get what, you're, you, get what you, you measure, right? You get, you get what you measure and reward. And so really look at your measurement and reward systems and ask yourself, are we, uh, are we incenting the right things? And, and I'm not saying you shouldn't have uh, sales growth or market share in there, but in Alaska Air Group's case, if you look at the scorecard of what everybody's paid on, that's one element out of four that constitute um, really the performance metrics. And customer satisfaction is a big one, obviously. Cost control is another one. Safety is another one. So what are the balance metrics that you're rewarding around that actually talk about your culture and reinforce that? And number five, if the culture needs adjusting, I guess that's obvious, which, you know, if you look at what Uber's going through now, I think it'll be a really interesting case study to see that culture, how it adjusts, and I think, you know, what, who's accountable? Uh, who's accountable and who's following up? And I know the board is paying a lot of attention right now, so it'll be really interesting to see how are they going to adjust the culture over time and who's accountable, and, and again, how are they following up? So I think really, I just want to conclude by saying, you know, the call to action to me uh, this morning is really to say, you know, a, a, a positive corporate culture matters. It matters to the bottom line, but it really, I think, matters to, um, you know, the larger communities and environments in which we operate. And it isn't going to be easy, by the way. It's not something that just happens, and then you can let it go, and it's fine. It really takes all of us, and it takes men and women, particularly in the diversity and inclusion journey. It takes you know all people of color and people that really have all diverse backgrounds, and it takes young people, really all of you, who are coming into the workforce. But I think for starters, at least, you know, a couple things that we can all think of ourselves as in this journey is certainly mentors. Number one, I mean, I I think all of us have an opportunity to mentor somebody else. I know a lot of you are mentors to somebody else, or Stu, you know, fellow students or, or there's some faculty here who are, are great mentors. So keep being a mentor always and really think about how can you coach in this environment that we're talking about. But number two, use our voices. Use our voices wherever we can. And I would say most often as I sit in a boardroom, being a diverse person, a, a woman and a person of color, I often have a very different view. Not always, but sometimes, and I often think, you know, you need to have the courage to say this, even though it may be different than the eight other people around the table. But it's important, it's important to use your diverse voice and make sure that you have a confident voice. If you see things differently or you see something out of alignment or you disagree or something isn't right, I find myself sometimes being the only voice in the room that speaks out. And that's important. And I, sometimes it just takes shoring up and a little more courage to do it, but it is important. And then last but not least, you know, empower others. Because I think, you know, one of the things that I've also found myself doing, if maybe there's two of us who are female in the room, 
and one woman says something and she gets ignored, I'll say, you know, Brenda said that earlier and I just want to make sure we hear that point. So empower others and help others um, support each other and really be uh, be an advocate, I think, for some of the voices in the room that may not get heard, especially you know, if they're, they're not as dominant a voice as others. So I think really in the end, what, what does this all mean? I'll just take a quote out of the Heydrich and Struggles report. They concluded in their article about uh, culture on the corporate continuum is, quote, cultivating a company culture to improve performance should not be taken lightly. It requires time, it requires commitment, it requires expertise and a strong roadmap and processes to succeed. So it really is a journey, not a destination. And as I said, it, it will result not just in a better organization, which it will, but it definitely will result in a better community and certainly, I think, a better society. So thank you. I'm going to open it up for your comments and questions. I think we've got about 20 minutes, right? So thank you. Thanks. Diversity is being asked to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance, mm. and I always thought about that is you can show faces and show show up, which is the biggest part. Mm -hmm. But then, what what is your experience as far as inclusion versus diversity? Sure, well, it's a great question, and the question was about maybe some of the difference between diversity and inclusion. And um, I think uh, Latondra Newton is somebody who you know I work with. I'm on the Toyota. North American Diversity Advisory Board. So Latondra was the chief diversity officer for a number of years. Now she went to Disney. I don't know if you heard that. Yeah, so she's uh, the CDO at Disney now. But um, wonderful person. And just to, uh, I don't know if everybody heard your quote, but she said, um, really, diversity is being invited to the party. True inclusion is being invited to dance, which I think is a wonderful metaphor. And I think that is really um, the difference, is that Diversity is important because it's a measurement and a metric that you can actually look at, see, and know by looking at percentages and numbers. And I think that's important, by the way. And I think when I sit on boards, I mean, I, as board members of any organization, I hope we ask that question about how are we making progress towards diversity? What do, you know, what do, how do we know? And I think that you've got to have a, a measurement. And I think that's really the diversity piece of it. It's, it's visual diversity. But the inclusiveness piece, I think, is much more important in that it means that, it, and that's the culture, by the way. Are we respectful in listening truly to the opinions of diverse folks that are at the table? Are we really inclusive in all ways of respecting everybody's background, opinions, no matter who they are? And it isn't necessarily just gender or ethnicity. It's sexual orientation. It's age, it's all the things that, you know, we all, I think, live every day, but I, that's much harder, and that's much harder to measure, by the way. That's where I, I think that's an important piece about being invited to dance, because that's what makes the culture, in, in a way, uh, sing, because it, it is, right, it is part of an environment of truly embracing a respectful, um, transparent, and open environment and, and making sure that you live that every day. And that's not easy. We all have biases, by the way. I mean, I would say I, I have my own biases and I have to overcome them all the time. When I'm sitting in a meeting and thinking, you know, what does this, um, what does this young Gen Z person, how can they possibly know about, you know, the history of this and that? And they say, you know what, stop that. You've got to listen. You've got to listen because this is really the future of our company, this is the future of our customers. So I think part of it is we just all have to sit back and, you know, it, it starts with us. Uh, we've got to be inclusive ourselves. We've got to model that and then, you know, hopefully model that in our workplaces. So it's a really, I'm glad you asked the question. I'll, uh, I'd like to ask you a question. Do you think you can have uh, a strong, positive culture in a company uh, when the CEO doesn't buy into it? And the board can do something, mm -hmm. but the board's not there every right. day yeah. messaging all the employees. And well, it's a, that's a really big question, Jim. And I, my answer is it's not a simplistic answer, but I'd say in general, you can't have a positive corporate culture without a strong CEO who lives that. I, I see so few examples where corporate culture can really live through a bad CEO for very long. I mean, I think you can 
maybe for a year, maybe for a temporary period of time if it's an interim CEO or maybe there, we can think of examples where CEOs have been there maybe a year and then the board suddenly says, wow, this person just absolutely does not live the values and, and they're gone. So, I mean, I think organizations' culture is strong enough that have strong cultures can live through that. But in general, over the long term, I, I don't see examples where if a CEO doesn't live it, doesn't model it, I think it affects the entire organization. I, can you think of examples? No, yeah. Okay. I think of, I think of the great companies, something like the Alaska Nordstrom, mm -hmm. they, they right. do have uh, CEOs that, that completely buy into right. positive corporate goals. Well, and, you know, and, and they are supported by their board. And they're supported yeah. by the board. And when, um, you know, when CEOs have a misalignment, I think the board has a responsibility to step in and do some serious uh, coaching and coach uh, intervention. But at the end of the day, if they don't live, you know, if they, they can't live up to it, then they have, they really have to go. I mean, I, I'll be interested to hear, to see what happens. I mentioned Uber with, um, many of you may have met Dara Kashrawi, Kishra, I'm not sure I'm saying his name right who was the CEO of Expedia, who's now there, and, and a wonderful guy. I think he was selected because he's a true leader in, in culture, but can he, so that's the, another side of the question, can a CEO actually change and entrench culture of a company? And that's, so that's kind of the other piece that I don't know the answer to that, but I think the board made a good selection in selecting him. The, the notion of discomfort is so, important when we have right. conversations about corporate culture because everybody we want everybody to be happy we want everyone to you know love coming to work mm -hmm. but sometimes we have to be uncomfortable in order to get up and move forward You're right and can you talk a little bit about your experience with that sure well yeah I think I mean that the whole notion of uh, it's not an easy journey and why isn't an easy journey of this is more now in the diversity and inclusion piece that forms good corporate culture, right? So the, the, the reason it's not easy and it becomes, to use your word, uncomfortable is because people will raise things that are out of alignment with the way you see the world or out of alignment with, you know, a couple of maybe strongly held opinions of how strategy should be executed, how, I mean, a lot of things. So I think what we have to learn as leaders is it is uncomfortable. And it's for the better in the long run, and but you need to sit through, sit and struggle with it a little bit and be willing to go on faith that at the end of the day, it will come back together. The one, the one thing that I would say, if you're asking you know, how I view this, is the one role that I find myself playing increasingly, and so I'll give the Foster School credit for my good training there, is to really be a synthesizer. So I think what, you know, all you learn, is, especially what all we learn in the MBA programs and you know, the good education here is that how do you bring disparate points of view in the room together and how do you think about the commonalities and the, the way things come together and what something that makes sense for the organization. And that's something I think we all get trained in. So I, I actually am very grateful to have had that kind of training. And so I think the, the two parts are, first of all, struggle with a little bit of messiness and uncomfortability and be okay with that. Make sure everybody at the table gets heard even if there's a very diverse and divergent point of view. And then at the end of the day, as a leader, I try to sit back and say, okay, how do I help bring this back together? I mean, even if I'm one of those divergent opinions, how do I say, you know, Bob brought this up and, you know, Sally brought this up, but here's a couple of things that actually I think you have in common, we have in common. Can we move forward on these couple of pieces? So I would just encourage all of us, and I think that's a role hopefully we can all play, is, you know, be more of a synthesizer of, but but be willing to let everybody have their say, especially the folks at the table who are quiet and introverted, because that's really, I think, the, sometimes the most valuable things you need to hear, the people who aren't saying anything. So I, I think as lead director, Jim, you've been in this seat too, is you really have to make sure that as the lead in the room that you're making sure you mind the best of sometimes that messiness that you say. So it's, it's a good point. Uh, so as as a person who's going to be uh, looking to get back into the workforce in about six months, um, and as a person who has been in uh, companies who, that haven't had very strong or very good corporate cultures, what are some questions that I can be asking during interviews uh, and during that process to get a sense of you know, the corporate culture and if it's going to be a good fit 
um, great question. versus finding out after I'm in it? No, it's a great question. And uh, I don't have a perfect answer to your question. Maybe I'll uh, give you a couple of um, pointers based on my own experience because I, I always tell people, especially if I go on a corporate board, I go through a lot of due diligence, not just the financials, by the way, but to your point, what is the culture really like? So the way I've done that, and I would continue to do it, is actually go out and talk to people who have left the organization. So in some cases, uh, when I, even when I went on the Nordstrom board, knowing how strong the culture was, and I was convinced that it had a great corporate culture, but I knew two directors who had left uh, prior to their, quote, retirement age, and I thought, you know, I just want to call them and find out. So I asked them a series of questions about, you know, how much does the family who control a, a pretty large portion of the company uh, mind the wisdom of independent directors? That was a question I had because I didn't want to go on a board where the independent directors had no voice. So, I, you know, I called people who left on the board. I actually called some employees of the company and said, you know, I know the company is known for X, Y, and Z. How does that really happen in the company? Does that really actually, in fact, um, get executed where the customers first where so I think calling people who formerly were associated with the organization is one great way to do it. Another way, if it's a customer-facing organization, is to you know, go out and do your own independent research, so to speak, right? Go to, go to the locations. And you know, I, I, I've been managing uh, people my whole career, and I can walk into a store or a bank branch, or, and I can instantly tell you within 10 minutes how things really are, how the environment is, how people treat each other, how people treat customers. So that'll tell, tell you a lot. Do your own independent research. And I, I, you know, the company will tell you probably what's on the vision, mission, value statement, you know, and that, that you would expect. But I think take that vision, mission, values and test it yourself. And I think testing it independently with customers, with current employees, former employees, if you're going on a board, former board members, I think it's really a good way to validate it. Does that answer the question? Okay. Michael? Phyllis, it's always great to hear you talk because you, you tend to be more optimistic about the future and trends than, than I do. Uh, <laughs> so, so well, I, you're it's, an it's academic, so. Start so. Out the day with Chef. <laughs> but, so, just, but, so you, you talked about some positive trends uh -huh. in culture, um, yeah. but I'm, I'm concerned about two, two sort of countervailing ones, okay. right? So one is um, that, that people who talk about diversity and inclusion tend to be people of color and women. Okay. not white men, right? Um, and that the marketplace seems to reward um, bad behavior. So you look at the bro culture in Silicon Valley, you look at the political leadership that gets elected here. I, I, I mean, how, how, how do you reconcile that? all that? I'm sorry? How do you reconcile yeah. all that? Yeah. yeah. Well, the first one is not easy because I've, you know, I think the Michael's point is that um, the usual suspects are always talking about this subject of diversity and inclusion, that being those of us who have been you know, affected by the probably negative side of this. How do you get the majority folks who sit mostly at the decision-making tables to really embrace this? And that's not easy, by the way, because I think even today when I go and talk to folks in our workforce about the Me Too, you know, positive, safe workplace environment, you know, I, I, I sense with a lot of men, they're saying, well, I don't even, you know, I don't even want to mentor any more women because I'm afraid that I'll get accused of, you know, sexual harassment or, so there's, there's sometimes this fear of if I engage in and if I am an advocate for, you know, I'm going to be either accused of something I don't like or my male colleagues will think I'm, you know, going overboard to try to, you know, be too, too, too the other way. So there is this tension that is still there and I, I, you know, I, all I have to say is that, you know, I think by talking to more people about the business benefits of diversity and inclusion and really drawing those parallels, I get a lot more attention from people to say there actually are studies by Catalyst, by McKinsey, that show a positive correlation when three women sit at a board table of a board of nine independent directors. There's actually positive correlation in business results. So you can't argue with that. And I think once you kind of go there with this is the link to to a you know to business performance, you get more attention, but it's slow. It's it's slow. It's generational. I think the you know certainly the oldest generation I think is going to have to yield to the younger generation who get this. I mean everybody in the room gets this here, but for those of you men in the room, I'd say you know it is your job to be allies and advocates in this because 
you're right. A male voice at the table speaking about this has, has more sway than somebody like me. There's no question. To your second point about what gets rewarded in the Wall Street, I guess, or in, in financial results, I really take issue maybe with your point about in the long run, bad behavior gets rewarded. So I actually think today, that's part of this trend thing I'm talking about. I think actually there's, with social media and everything, there's so much more transparency, I mean radical transparency about bad behavior. And it becomes part of that, what I would say, reputational equity or a dent to reputational equity that actually affects stock value. So I think it's changed actually. And I think that you'll see uh, much more over time where uh, bad behavior will be on the news within, you know, 60 seconds, not six months, and it will affect behavior. So I think th if we think about it that way, we think reputation is a, is a real corporate asset. Reputation is linked to good behavior. Reputation is linked to understanding that you have to be part of society that manages, you know, really positive stakeholder engagement, and that's more than your shareholders. So I, I think that has changed a lot. I don't know if that kind of gets to your second point. Silicon Valley, that's probably another subject <laughs> another time. Ask, what advice would you give to, you know, like the team or someone who's not part of the decision-making team to mm. actually make change in that culture? Mm -hmm. If the CEO isn't buying into it, the decision-makers aren't buying into it, what can you do to ensure positive culture in the office? Sure. Yeah, no, I get, I get your point. I think we all have a role to play, and that's why I think I'm challenging all of us to think that Sometimes we can say, because I'm not the CEO, because I'm not Jamie Dimon, I can't necessarily affect you know, my area and my corporate culture. I don't manage a thousand people. But you, know, you have a role to play in setting an example, setting a tone, maybe hosting discussion groups, and I think that, and mentoring others, by the way. So I guess I would say that I never abdicate my role in that sense and always say, you know, I always have a role to play. Even when I was at the Seattle Foundation, I only managed 20 people. But I thought, you know, we have an opportunity here to create the culture we want. So part of it is really making sure that, that you play a role as a colleague in helping that. Now, the, the question that you bring up, which is back to Jim's question, if you have a CEO, though, that isn't with you, that's, you know, just not creating a good culture, then I think you have to think, is it worth raising the issue to other people within the organization that can help uh, make a change? And that's a tough one, because that's where I think so many of the whistleblowers in so many organizations, unfortunately, have not always been rewarded. So. That's a larger question. I don't have a good answer for you, but I do think taking it seriously within your own environment and making sure that you get as many allies as you can and modeling the culture and mentoring others and coaching and is really an important role that we all play. And, and um, I, you know, I just wanted to make sure that I left everybody with the idea that we all have a role to play and we all have a voice here and we have a responsibility. Thank you. Um, as companies grow and shift, culture shifts, and they have challenges. Uh, yeah. I think there's a lot of companies that start out with a particular culture, and over time, and for a variety of business reasons, the culture shifts. And, and one prime example comes to mind, which is Alaska, which has been appearing in the news lately. Right. So kind of to mention the elephant in the room. Sure. Um, and I was on an Alaska flight yesterday, and, and I, I could tell that there wasn't a high, as high a level of engagement as I've seen in the past. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So can you, can you talk about the obstacles that occur and how to get a culture on the track that you, that you sure. is the positive one, either mm -hmm. returning to the culture you had yep. or, or moving to the culture you want? Absolutely. No, it's a great um, example, and I don't mind addressing that at all because it's something that occupies a lot of time of management and the board. So. For those of you that don't recall, Alaska bought uh, Virgin America, which is a company that's not equal to size, but it's a significant acquisition for the company. And I think the one question the board asked in the acquisition was not about the numbers, not about the acquisition price, not about the premium, but it was about the culture. How can we convince ourselves that the, these cultures at least have some similarities, even if the brands are different, so that the culture that has defined Alaska doesn't get 
compromised in this major acquisition. And that was a significant part of the board meeting. So I think, you know, in an M&A situation, that really is, should be a front and center question, and it was here. Now the issue, of course, is the devil's in the details, so to speak. And when you do merge, and right now the merger is going on with the two brands being actually put together, there's a lot of anxiety about what does that mean for my job? What does that mean for my hours? What does that mean for my scheduling? And there are also labor negotiations going on with the unions at the same time. So just so you know that this happens all the time. So you know, you, you've got exogenous forces, competition, labor contract negotiations. You've got mergers going on with different practices, different things coming together. It's going to cause a lot of temporary turmoil. And I think we realize that. The question is, how do you get it back together? So I think what you're seeing right now, and those of you that have read the articles that you're referencing, uh, there have been some questions about Horizon Air had scheduling problems last year. There were you know, pilot shortages. So all those things just happen because it's business and it's messy sometimes. The question is, how do you get it back together? And I think that's something that you're absolutely right. It's, that's why I said it's not something that you can just leave to, oh, it'll all work eventually when we get all the boxes checked on the merger, when we get all the operational things uh, harmonized, and we get all the websites together, everything will be great. Well, you know that's not true. And so I think Alaska is in a time now where um, there's a turmoil going on. There's questions about jobs and futures and how does this all really come together, especially actually more on the Virgin America side. So I think the board and Brad Tilden, who you know is a great CEO, are really spending a lot of time on is re-enrolling people in the value. So actually management, as we speak right now, is going out, every one of them, you know, there's probably 20 of them, they're going out and meeting with every single employee in the company at every location. So they're on planes, sitting down in groups of 30, talking about culture, talking about values, listening to people's concerns, and that will kind of all come back, hopefully, will come all back together. So it is a time of turmoil, but, you know, I think the company knows it's got to return to the roots, and that is the culture and values that has made Alaska great. And just speaking uh, to that, I know Brad Tilden sent out a letter to, you know, I, I got one, so I'm imagining 30,000 people uh, got this letter. And he's not trying to, you know, sweep the problems under the rug. These are the problems. Right. Here's how we're going to solve them. Here's how we're going to be Alaska Airlines, the Alaska Airlines you, you know, you know and, and hopefully love. Right, so right. It was re really powerful. Good. Yeah, he did. And, and I know that those articles interviewed a lot of folks, different folks, and, you know, I think Brad would say, well, it's probably not the way that three-fourths of the workforce feel, but if a quarter are disenfranchised and have anxieties and problems, then that's a problem. Got to, got to find out what the concerns are and get to them. So it's a, con you know, I think back what we said, it's a journey, not a destination. So, hey. Um, so my, my question is in regards to growing and um, for nonprofit boards. So if you are serving on a nonprofit board or you work at for a nonprofit, like what type of advice do you give to those nonprofits in regards to growing the diversity of the board? Uh, yeah, so I think, you know, nonprofit boards versus corporate boards, uh, there is a difference, as you know, and I think the thing I always found challenging on nonprofit boards is people are there totally as volunteers. And so I always say you have to, first of all, make sure you have people that are passionate about the mission. And I, I always, when people ask me, what, on what board should I serve on a nonprofit, I say, well, first of all, what do you care about? So I think, first of all, you know, with that as the main gate and main criteria, is making sure you find people that are really passionate about the mission. But I think the second thing is common for corporate boards and nonprofit boards, diverse, finding diverse candidates is really hard because they're not usually the obvious people for, you know, for every reason we know. So I think part of what I think we used to do at the Seattle Foundation is we'd say for every opening that we have on our board, are we looking at at least a pool of two diverse folks for every one you know, mainstream? folk that were on the board, because our, our board, when I came into the Seattle Foundation, was pretty much all mainstream. I think only one person of color on the board, well, there were two out of a 25-person board. So I think just making sure that you're very rigorous about your process of uh, who are all the people out here that are passionate, and then underneath that, can we find two diverse candidates for everyone who's not diverse? And how do you really make sure you expand the network? And that's hard. I mean, honestly, I wish I could say it was easy, 
but I think by the very act of having your governance nominating committee, be really rigorous about uh, the pool and making sure that you don't just automatically fill a position because we're all human beings and we all like to fill spots with people we know or people that look like us or think like us. So I, I, I just say I think you just have to work harder and over time, um, you know, talking to a lot of people and making sure they're, they get your culture, they get your mission, they're passionate about what you do, but making sure you have a diverse slate is, I think, always an important part of the process. Does that answer your question? Okay. Well, Listen. Well, Phyllis, that was a, a terrific well, and thank you. very, very timely uh, presentation. Thank, thank you, you so Jim. Well, thank you. Great questions. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>